First of all, are the markets too complacent? It seems like Marine Le Pen has momentum in her campaign, and actually this time she could become president. Yeah, I think uh, nobody has really looked at the program of the various candidates, obviously. Uh, it was uh, more or less under, under the screening of uh, everybody. So we will see what happens now that yeah. the program will be screened very, very cautiously. What do you think Marine Le Pen stands for? We, uh, we understand that she's no longer advocating a Frexit, but she's still anti-immigration, anti-globalization. So what does it mean for the economy of this country? Well, she's anti-globalization, of course, anti-Europe. Even if she didn't say that uh, she would call for Frexit or she would call for uh, abandoning the euro because she understood that it was not a winner at all. But still, of course, she's not at all pro-European. She was very close to uh, Russia and to President Putin, which is more or less the, I would say, attitude of the extreme right uh, in Europe, in all, all European countries, close to Putin. So, again, it, is, it would be a major, major political strategy change for France and for Europe. Yeah, this would be almost like an earthquake when it comes to European politics. Give us a sense of why her campaign has been gaining so much momentum. She's focused on the cost of living, on taking care of, of the ones that are suffering the most from inflation. Can Emmanuel Macron counter that? He, he's done a bit, actually, to try and, and, you know, make that burden a little bit more livable. No, the problem in France with this system where you have 12 candidates, but only two are making up for the second round, you have an immense... Uh, power, if I may, or influence of strategic vote or useful vote, as yeah. we say in yeah. France, vote utile. Yeah. And of course, it concentrates the votes of a certain constituency. And we have three major constituencies in France. When you make all the accounting, mm -hmm. you see 32 percent extreme right, yeah. uh, sovereignist, uh, anti-European and so forth. You have 32 left. Uh, a very few, unfortunately, in many respects, I would say, social democrat left, but you have also a lot of, uh, I would say, radical left, obviously, and Greens, but the same percentage, 32, and the centrist, Macronist, pro-European, pro-market economy are representing also 32. I mean, the, the lesson of, the, of, of the, the election is really a division of the country between the three. So, Mr. Trichet, this means that it's going to be very difficult for Emmanuel Macron to be president without any doubt of his losing, because he doesn't have that buffer that he enjoyed in 2017. There was a lot of people having that anger vote, right, that you know, either voted for Éric Zemmour, for Marine Le Pen, or even Jean-Luc Mélenchon. At this stage, one thing is absolutely sure, it would be a close call, a very close call. And, uh, one can understand that because everything remains on the translation of the voters of the left. Whether they will go as the leaders of the left are calling for, not to vote on Le Pen, implicitly or explicitly to vote for Macron, will they follow this, uh, I would say, uh, recommendation or uh, whether they would sp split their votes. If they split their votes, it's an extremely cold call, close call. If they do not, then I would say there is a good chance, of course, that Macron will win with some margin. So if right now, do you worry about voters not going to vote? So the abstention and how many people are still undecided that Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen will try and win over in the next two weeks? I think that a lot of people would, and this is new, Accept that, after all, all taken into account, even after the war in Ukraine, uh, Le Pen would be right. a possible yeah. president. I think that it is not the majority uh, view, but it's, it's a strong view, which we had not five years ago. Uh, that being said, again, a, a very tough campaign is now coming in. The president did not really campaign before for many reasons, including the fact that when you have 11 candidates that are against you, it's uh, very difficult to campaign correctly. But in the second round, it's a uh, one-to-one. Yes, one, and I yeah. expect that uh, the, the, I would say, campaign will be very tough. And, uh, and we will see exactly what happens. But I take it that normally, also taking into account the, 
the recommendations of the left, yeah. Macron should win. In the next two weeks, what should be the strategy of each candidate? Is there, uh, you know, can Emmanuel Macron refocus on the ties that Marine Le Pen has had, for example, with Russia, and do the French citizens care? Well, I, I expect both candidates, of course, to concentrate on the weak points of their adversary. Uh, the weak point of Macron is that he was in power for five years. Yes. And the experience in France uh, shows to which extent this is a handicap, because you have to renew your uh, own future and uh, expect, explain why you are doing better in the second term. Uh, now, uh, of course, Uh, Madame Le Pen has a lot of uh, weakness also, and uh, the main weakness is certainly uh, anti to be anti-European, to be close to Russia and Putin, and uh, to, I would say, have a program which is not financed. There's a big repricing when it comes to Treasuries, the 10-year U.S. yield, 2.75%. So it's getting higher. How difficult is it at the moment for policymakers to deal with inflation without tipping us into recession? You've lived us through this. Yeah, I, I think that what is absolutely decisive, of course, is to continue to solidly anchor inflation expectations. If you solidly anchor inflation expectations, whatever happens with the hump of inflation, which is due to price of oil and commodities, and gas and so forth, which is the case on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, but if, if you keep on, under control, and it, it relies entirely upon your credibility. And the yeah. problem is to preserve credibility of the Fed on the one hand, of the ECB on the other hand, in a very, very difficult circumstance. I mean, as soon as you say anchoring inflation expectations, it brings me way back. It's like, you know, the, the fuzzy feeling when I used to uh, cover all of your press conferences. Yeah. This yeah. is different because there's a supply shock. Yeah. There's a big supply shock coming from Ukraine and Russia. True. So how do you navigate this? True, true. We had also supply shocks in my time, I have to say. You know, uh, when I Not left, the, the last, my last year, we had 4% of headline. And 4% of headline means, of course, that you have a supply shock and the, the price of commodities are picking up much too uh, violently. Uh, but the problem, again, is to maintain the uh, second round effects yes. under control. And you have them under control if everybody is convinced that in any case, over the medium run, you will uh, supply, if I may, 2%. Yes. Uh, which, is, But, which is the common goal uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. But how much of a headache is this now for Europe? So we went, to, we started the year in saying, look, there's an inflation problem in the U.S. There are cyclical effects in the U.S. that we don't have here in Europe. And suddenly, because of the proximity to China, the proximity to Ukraine and Russia and the reliance on Russian oil and gas, it's a huge headache here that came up and cropped up violently. You're absolutely true. Uh, we had already before the war in Ukraine, a very big, big problem of uh, price of oil commodity, uh, agricultural product, yeah. which were much too high. And then we have, and of course, Europe is really at stake, this war in Ukraine and the dependency on oil and gas coming from, uh, from Russia. So again, I think that we are more or less in the same situation now on both sides of the Atlantic because of this uh, new hump of headline inflation due to the war. That being said, until now, inflation expectations were much better anchored in Europe than in the US. Uh, up to now, I have to say, the core inflation in Europe was much lower. We, we were at 2.9% in yeah. the euro area, 6% in the US. So big difference big before difference. the full impact of the war. Yes, and a difficult, I guess, you know, cyclical moment also for the economy. Yeah. Talk to us about sequencing that the ECB needs to make sure that the markets get right. <laughs> I, I have full confidence in the governing council of the ECB, so okay. I have no recommendations for them. But I would say the last decision they took were clearly mentioning the fact that they were very, very cautious, prudent, and wanted to signal that they would not remain excessively accommodating if there was an incurring of inflation expectations. So I trust them to continue to have this attitude, which is very yeah. important for markets, participants, yes. for every, every uh, I would say, economic agents and for the social partners. They have to count on medium term 2%. We're also seeing in China with concerns about growth, but also concerns about the COVID zero policy and what that means for trade. Is the Fed now the central bank to the world? No, <laughs> no more than before. 
uh, of course, it is uh, the, the dollar is very important, no doubt. Proportion is one to three between the euro and the dollar. But I would not say that he changes everything. Do, do you think the dollar dominance, because of what we're seeing in Russia and some of the sanctions, will slowly dwindle as more countries try and get away from it? In the very long term, there is always a drawback with uh, sanctions. And it is true that uh, the United States has to be careful in practicing sanctions, including, I have to say, uh, freezing the assets of central banks. That, that is something because which would I would not have recommended myself, yeah. frankly speaking. B because but, it would backfire that, longer term or because yeah, the second be, round effects are too big? Because a number of other central banks would say, ho oh, oh, ho, I'm not that sure that uh, I can. So there, there is something there which is extremely delicate and has yeah. to be, I would say, priced in yeah. the decisions in uh, Washington.